Welcome back to the main stage, everyone. Thank you again for carving out your time to spend with us at the Risk Five Global Forum. I'd like to welcome you back to the keynotes, and I would like to also extend my deep gratitude and appreciation to our sponsors at Platinum Level Western Digital, our gold sponsors, Cloudbear, IAR Systems, Adacore, Open Hardware Group, and Huawei. Our silver sponsors, Kaben, NSI, TEXE, Qualcomm, and GigaDevice. Thank you so much for your generosity. Without your help, we would not be able to host such a fantastic event spanning 18 hours in the entire globe. Thank you. Sit back now, relax, join the chat, take full advantage, visit our sponsors, and enjoy the keynotes ahead. Thank you. Hi, Chris here. Uh, I'm excited to be giving a virtual keynote at this first Risk 5 Global Forum. Um, so uh, let's just dive in. Um, so what I want to talk about today really is um, look at the sort of objectives and goals of the Risk 5 project from when we started uh, over the last 10 years, how it's changed, and what we should be looking at doing uh, the next uh, period. So uh, where are we now? So what's amazing to me still is that it's only been five years since we created the original foundation, um, and already people view the idea of a free and open RISC-V ISA as a real alternative to existing proprietary ISAs. Um, I remember when we started pushing the idea out, a lot of people said, well, there's no way you can have an open standard ISA be the basis of what happens in industry. Um, and that's kind of flipped around now, and people kind of see it as an obvious idea, and you see other ISAs um, are trying to adopt the same model as well. Um, so that's incredible that this has come along in only the five years uh, the foundation has existed. Um, in academia and research, we see risk five being widely adopted, basically a clean sweep. I think Stefan uh, gave a talk earlier this morning about activity in academia with risk five. Um, it's a great success there. Um, but there are a lot of gaps still in uh, applic different application areas. Um, but there is a lot of enthusiasm in the community. There's also a lot of funding coming in from corporate investors and uh, governments uh, to help fund development. And that's really driving this rapid progress. And um, you know, you can bet that if there's a gap in the ecosystem, somebody somewhere is probably working on it right now. Um, so let's talk about the ecosystem a little. Let's kind of review how RISC-V works. Um, so we have RISC-V International sits in the middle and really manages the ISA specification, uh, as well as the go-to model and the compliance tests. So um, RISC Five International manages this specification, and that spec is really the bridge between um, software and hardware. So the hardware implementers, of which there are many, take that specification and go build designs. Um, now, one thing people often mistake about RISC Five is they say that RISC Five is an open source processor, and that's just not correct. So RISC Five is a open specification. And because the spec is open, it means you can have open source processors. And there's a big variety of those available um, uh, from different places all around the world developing open source cores. Um, but as well as the open source cores, there's also commercially licensed cores. So these are cores that you have to pay to use, but they come with companies who uh, develop them, verify them, support them. Um, and uh, what's incredible right now is there's so many commercial core providers, again, from different places around the world, and at this point, RISC V really has more commercial IP providers than any other ISA ever in history. That's kind of incredible. Now, as well as the open source cores and commercial cores, they can also be in-house developed cores. For example, NVIDIA develops their own RISC V cores that they use on their GPUs. Um, and what's great about RISC V, it gives you this freedom. You can choose whether you want an open source implementation, a commercial implementation, or just build one yourself. So on the hardware side, this is great. You have this choice. Um, now, on the software ecosystem side, uh, RISC V is being supported by, again, there's a big activity in the open source domain. Um, most of the upstream uh, projects are taking RISC V as a main, mainline architecture in those upstream projects, GCC, Linux, for example. Um, but it's not only about open source software, there's a large commercial uh, software ecosystem developing around RISC V as well, from companies like Cloudbark and Sega, IAR, developing tools to help um, people develop the RISC-V uh, commercially. These are commercially licensed tools you have to pay to use. Um, now, what's great about RISC-V is it accesses intermediate open specification. 
So all the hardware providers, they can build cores. And as long as they obey that specification, they get to take advantage of this big software ecosystem, both commercial and open source. Uh, similarly, the software developers, if they target RISC-V standard, they know that their tools will work across all the hardware implementations coming from these different vendors. So that's really the idea of the RISC-V ecosystem, how it's intended to work. Now, um, RISC-V has come a long way. Um, we used to joke about the project goal, um, but it's sort of become more real. And this is a slide I used at the, the summit last December. Um, we want to become industry standardized, say, for all computing devices, and it's kind of happening. And uh, what's more, it's happening much faster across more domains than anybody really predicted. Um, and what I see is there's demand for every performance level from you know, tiny energy harvesting microcontrollers all the way up to ludicrous supercomputer uh, performance. Um, and there's really a demand for every feature that's ever been put in any ISA ever. Um, somehow we need to support that in RISC V as well. Now this is really a function of success. People want to use RISC V. That's why there's this demand to um, have it be supported and have all these features it needs in all these different domains. So when we started the project, we had a set of objectives and goals and how we'd run the project. And then over time, you kind of learn as you go. Um, so you know, there's no way we could have predicted where we'd be now and um, or really how broad and deep the demand would be. Um, nobody's done this at this scale before. So we couldn't really plan 10 years ago, perfectly set out how we're going to run everything. Um, so over time, your objectives change, becomes clear over time what you're actually doing um, as you see the thing evolve. So let's take a look back. I think it's good to go back and see what were we thinking back in 2010? What were our initial goals? Um, so really wanted to build a simple, efficient, extensible ISA for our own research into application-specific processes. Um, and because we wanted to do specialized processes um, and doing research, we didn't want to bake in any technology or microarchitecture assumptions or anything about the privileged architecture because we wanted to do research in those areas. We wanted to not bake in anything into the design. Um, we wanted to make it easy to document, to build it, to teach it because they're in a university environment with only limited resources. Um, it obviously had to be easy to modify because we were going to do research with it. This was one of the problems we had with existing uh, proprietary ISAs. It was difficult to change them without losing all the software. Um, in previous projects, we tried to use commercial ISAs and we just had this problem that we couldn't share RTL with our colleagues. And so one of the goals was have something that made it, that had no barrier to sharing the designs with colleagues. Um, we wanted to support the standard compiler tool chain, the standard operating system, so we could get work done and get software up and running on, on these cores quite quickly. So those are our goals. Um, but back then we had some non-goals, things we were not trying to do with the design as well. So our initial um, non-goals, um, we did want to have a innovative base ISA design. Um, there's a lot of interesting computer architecture ideas out there, um, but we were looking in a different um, sort of space. We didn't want to have to, for example, spend all our time figuring out how to build a C compiler for a data flow machine. Um, we just wanted something that worked um, from day one. Um, and, you know, we would deliberately set out to create a pretty boring risk design. That was uh, um, the idea. So it was a non-goal to make the base ISA be very innovative. Um, also, it was a non-goal to take over the world. We really were not thinking of shipping billions of RISC-V cores every year or replacing servers, laptops, tablets, phones, all those processes of RISC-V. That really was not the intention when we started this project. Um, moving on a bit, so as we pushed it out, as we saw there was interest in industry, um, I sort of thought back to what were our goals when we were founding the original foundation back in 2015. This is with Rick O'Connor when we were creating the original RISC-V Foundation. Um, so at that point, we saw industry was very interested. We wanted to bring industry into the fold. Um, and so we wanted this to be a place that was a central, stable home for the ISA spec. This would uh, bring in the industry participants. They could see it's something stable. Um, also, getting everybody together would avoid fragmentation. That was a big concern. I think if we'd only been trying to do an academic ISA design, this would not have been as important because you know, it doesn't matter if somewhat if the academics drift in their own particular flavor of RISC V, they can sort of share stuff and sort of make things work. But in industry, people making big investments and um, building uh, large, expensive implementations, they're likely to be stable and um, have this model. 
Um, so I think having the foundation was critical to get industry really on board. And we wanted industry on board because we could see that this would make it more real. There'd be more software, more implementations. It'd be better for academia to have industry behind this standard as well. Um, we also wanted broader participation in spec development, get more people interested in working on this. Um, but there was a theme you're kind of people at the time were worried about one of the corporations coming in and hijacking the standard, like driving it off, monopolizing it uh, as well. So the way we created the membership rules were to, to avoid that. Um, and we wanted to build this unified community to really promote the ISA, like a whole, um, the community coming together around a single design and then promoting that out to others to use. So in 2015, we also had some things we were not trying to do back then. So in particular, uh, we realized that we shouldn't endorse any implementations, including open source ones. So the foundation should remain neutral. Um, and so it's not going to bless any core as a standard core. It's just going to focus on the specifications, the compliance tests, and not provide standard cores. And this has been a continuing source of confusion where people think the risk five core is at the foundation. Um, and that's just not correct. We, just manage the specification. And there are many cores out there that you can try, many different shapes and sizes of core to use. Another non-goal was to provide a lot of central engineering resources. Um, you know, back then, simply the funding was way too small to do anything. And also we were worried about um, tax status of being a nonprofit that did contract engineering for its members in effect. So we had to worry about that too, but basically there was not enough funding anyway to do central engineering. So those were non-goals back then when we created the foundation. Sort of fast forward a bit now, it's 2020, it's five years in, um, and the foundation has changed into RISC-5 International. Um, so, you know, what do people actually want from RISC-5? What do the community want? Um, and here I'm using a very broad uh, definition of community. It's like everybody out there in the entire semiconductor industry. Um, I talked to a lot of people, uh, a lot of different companies, and I think if I distill it down, I'd say, well, people, they really like the change of business model. That's what gets them excited. But they ideally would like to use RISC V without having to do any other work, without having to change anything else, right? So what that means is replace the proprietary ISA with a free and open ISA that happens to run all the existing software and fits into existing SOC design. Okay, so this is, um, it's very understandable. Um, the mo motivation is very clear, it's very sensible. Um, but this is what I think most people would really like from RISC V, just um, you know, swap and replace, proprietary, free and open, and keep going with business as usual. Um, now, um, you know, the thing to say is, you know, I, you know, I spend all my life working on instruction sets, but most people don't care about instruction sets. And even then, you know, I, when I'm buying a, a toothbrush, I don't usually worry about which instruction set is in there. When you're buying a product, you don't really care about the ISA. It's not high on your priority list for choosing that product. Where you do care about the ISA is when things break. So for example, you know, we've seen this when people, you know, tried to run Windows on non-X86 platforms, a lot of problems, things just didn't work as people expected. Or run trying to run Android on a non-owned ARM device, right? So people really only care about the ISA when things break. Um, otherwise, they don't really care about it at all. Um, now, the thing I'll say is I'll, I'll emphasize software in this talk, but really it's a bit more than just that, it's also people want the cores to plug and play into existing SOC infrastructures. So, you know, trace debug systems, the way memory handles coherence, memory ordering, security models, memory maps, all these things um, are factors if you have an existing SOC design that you're moving forward to a new generation and you want to replace some of the cores or RISC five cores, uh, these are the things you end up worrying about. How is it going to plug and play with the existing design for all these features in the SOC level? So I think it's sort of sort of summarizing all of this, looking back at how priorities really changed from 2010 to 2020. Um, back in 2010, priority was really, you know, be simple, efficient, extensible. Um, we were interested in revisiting some of the legacy design decisions. Could we make it better? Um, and have some basic software that let us do our research. And, you know, this was a, really a computer architecture driven project. We were computer architects doing research. So no big surprise. We did a computer architecture driven project. But in 2020, if I look at RISC-V now, I think the priorities really are, you know, run all software, uh, be feature complete. And by that, I mean, have things like hypervisor and um, functional safety, because you need to run all software and software needs some of these features in order to run. Um, 
be stable. People investing heavily, they want things to um, keep working. And this also helps with running all software. If you have to keep fixing the software because the ISA changes, that's not going to help you finish running all the software. So being stable is also very important. And of course, we also want to support innovation. I'll talk later about, doesn't this, the worry that maybe if you're trying to be, you know, run all software, be feature complete and stable, doesn't this get in the way of innovation? I don't think so. So we'll, we'll cover that later, but it, it is a, a worry. It's a good worry to think about. Um, but at this point, I think what we see is in 2020, RISC-V is really a software driven project. It's all about running code that people want to run. That's you know why we're developing out RISC-V, right? So I think it's a change of mindset from being a computer architecture project to being really a software project. So let's go through these. So you priority. So I think, you know, priority number one is run all software. Now it's obviously a massive effort to port all existing software to RISC-V. Um, but, you know, along the way, we have made some design decisions that help um, just to give you a flavor of some of these where we didn't really have a strong opinion or where we knew it would make uh, a big uh, difference. We did things like, for example, pick Little Endian as the native endian because we saw most of this Little Endian. Um, we also, uh, had long discussions about the base page size. Many architects said they should be bigger than whatever, but we picked four kilobytes. And I think that was actually a very wise decision. It made it a lot easier to bring up a lot of software. Um, another big decision was in the memory model. So we had to have a, a weak memory model to support embedded systems that didn't have complex processors and complex caches, uh, but it couldn't be too weak because it'd be too difficult to program. So we went with a not too weak memory model as the base but we also provided a stronger TSO extension that could be used in cases where the um, software is coming from an environment that assumes a stronger memory ordering. Um, now, we're also working on adding other features to support um, software running in SOC. So for example, the cache maintenance operations, there's a task group just starting up to provide those. And that'll help um, some designs. Um, but there's a lot, there's a long list of features you may need to add to help um, with software ports. Now, one that's come up recently on a thread on the lists, but actually showed up a few times in the past, we've considered this, is a double word compare and swap. And this is a really nasty instruction to implement, um, but a lot of software has been built around it because some of the dominant ISAs have this um, instruction. So that's something we may want to consider just to help with software ports. Or is there some other clever way of getting around this? But basically, this is the kind of thing we have to worry about is can we provide the features that make it easier to bring up the ports? Because people really need software to run to make systems viable. So it's obviously very important to engage with the software communities here. Um, so RISC-V should be seen as the ISA that's owned by the software community. So we really have to work together with the software developers, working with the member architects, so we can refine the ISA designs um, suggest features that are going to help with porting, find better solutions to software challenges. You know, things like security is a big issue. Um, we can maybe provide a better solution than existing ones for security. And also to enable new application domains. What's really holding back um, the use of RISC-V in some of these new domains or what do these new domains need that nothing is providing right now? Um, you know, one thing is, can we get involved with the software community earlier in the design? Um, you know, most of the ISA owners uh, proprietary ISA owners, they don't develop all the software that runs on the system, but the software community has to make do with what's you know shipped out from those companies. We'd like to engage earlier, have the software community involved in building this design. Um, we've seen some success there with Hypervisor. I think we should you know look to that model to do a lot more things that way, actually get the software community involved much earlier and build the things they really need to run the software. Um, being feature complete. So, um, there's a large set of uh, groups at the foundation covering a whole range of uh, issues like hypervisor, security, functional safety, HPC, trace and debug. Um, and um, one thing I'll say is it's great to do all these things, but it's, it's quite difficult to keep the ISA coherent if many new things are being added simultaneously. Um, so I think the model here is we should really try and focus and finish things. You know, it's great to be looking at all these areas, but um, if you look at a given application domain, it's much better to have 100% of the solution for one domain than half the solution for 100 domains, right? So um, you know, at the RISC-V International uh, uh, with Mark and others, we're trying to streamline the processes there, uh, improve communication, get, give some focus. So we can 
you know, develop and prioritize what we're calling application verticals, given domains. And within those domains, try and prioritize those and try and finish um, the gaps, complete the missing gaps in those verticals to make those be successful before we move on and do all the others. So really, you know, there's a limited bandwidth to keep a coherent ISA design together while we go attack all these different areas. Be stable. So, um, you know, this was part of our promise really when we created the foundation. We're gonna create an industry strength ISA, which means solid specifications. And really around 2017, I remember telling people, this is when we're gonna start creating the RISC-V legacy. Um, and so we, we have to maintain backwards compatibility. Um, so each of the ISA modules is really frozen, but we can add new modules to provide new features and new capabilities. Um, there's, you know, people should realize there's been a significant investment already in hardware and software. Um, you know, and even though the, the RISC-V ISA is definitely not perfect, there's a lot of things we could spend time tweaking and changing and, you know, improving a little bit, but we can't break compatibility at this point. And so instead of going back and trying to, you know, do risk six or try to change things around, we should focus on the missing features. That's really where our energy should be going. Um, supporting innovation. I mean, this was the original reason we created risk five. Um, and, you know, we built it with this modular ISA design and the whole point was to allow standard software to run despite the existence of the custom instructions. And so this really was designed from the beginning to let you innovate while keeping compatibility and stability, right? Um, uh, another aspect here is we have an open spec and that means that there's no permission needed to go experiment and use and publish your results. So this is where we get innovation is everybody's free to go try things out. Just go try your idea out and you can report it and publish it. And there's a great program at this forum today uh, with a lot of people who've just gone and done that. That's great. Um, so it's wonderful to see all this innovation, people trying all these things out. But the flip side is, it's great to have all these technology choices, but it's really up to the members to, to decide on which of these things actually gets pulled in and standardized. Uh, it really is, has to be a, a pull from the, the users and not a, just a technology push. We don't want to just add and standardize a bunch of things that seem like good ideas, unless people really care about them. Okay, just to wrap up here. Um, you know, the goals are really, we have to be able to run all software. So we want to kind of figure out how to remove the bottlenecks that exist to run existing code bases. Um, be feature complete. I really want to, like people really want to put RISC five everywhere, but we should try and prioritize and get, you know, focus on a few domains and really finish all of those first. Um, be stable. We, we cannot break the existing RISC five standards. Um, we have to be a very solid and stable um, ISA for everybody. And, you know, innovate. We design the things so you can run software, be feature complete and stable while innovating. Okay, so I'll leave it there. Thanks, everybody.